you very much. Um, Gaston Nguyen, I'm the community team staff specialist from Liverpool Brain Tree Unit, which is one of three metropolitan Sydney brain tree rehab centres. Uh, I'm here joined by several of my colleagues from the centre, also on behalf of the director of our college, Dr. Ally Tomkinson. Um, I have two uh, questions, and the first one probably more kind of a comment in that we um, envisaging there can be potential difficulties um, in the future when the scheme is falling out in our area and how we are going to reconcile with the current um, lifetime camp support system, which I, I think uh, we are very conscious of that. But also a more immediate and more um, present issue, um, yeah. and perhaps um, my other colleagues from the other brain unit uh, may have similar experiences. Um, even though we're based at Liverpool, we provide um, care for other clients from out of area, such as the Itawara or the ACT. Currently, we have uh, a couple of clients, uh, one from the ACT and the Hunter Valley, who have very high support needs. Um, and if there's more details, one of my colleagues might be able to if, um, elaborate on that. Um, but the issues that we're currently experiencing is that um, for those pilot areas, one we approach um, the services for referral, mm -hmm. we were told that they would need to be physically living in that area before the referral could be um, accepted. Um, and the clients, uh, the level which they are not ready to be transferred to a local generic rehab services. Um, so, unless we would look at the option of transferring into a nursing home facility in order to be physically in the area that referral would be, um, you know, initiated, um, that that would be a very extreme um, measure. But um, yeah. Lauren, do you want to elaborate on anything? Sorry, thank you, Justin. Um, Lauren Christie, I'm the Intervention Coordinator of the Paul uh, Brain Injury Unit. Um, as Gaston has just explained. Um, the difficulty or the challenge that we're facing at the moment is, um, as he's elaborated on, we cover a large geographical area. Clients who are approaching discharge from their acute state, where we're trying to um, establish plans so that they will have the appropriate supports in place when they leave our unit. Um, but because they live within what's a trial catchment area, we've been advised that nothing can be put in place until they're back within that geographical area. And the difficulty being that due to the complexity of their care needs, it's not appropriate for us to be transferring them back to local based facilities to wait for that to happen. So we're just wondering if there's sure. any plans to address that issue. Sure, let me deal with the first one first. Um, the NDIS operates in conjunction with uh, a commitment to a national injury insurance scheme and under the agreements between the Commonwealth and States up until the end of transition, so that's 2019, States have obligations to uh, provide for the care and support for people injured in motor vehicles or workplace accidents outside of the NDIS. So that will be lifetime care in New South Wales um, and perhaps the work cover and similar comp sorries elsewhere where the state doesn't have a no fault scheme and so someone doesn't have a claim that would get them in. If the person comes into the NDIS, we just do a recovery from the relevant state. So there will be coverage uh, for that for uh, state uh, for states where there's no nothing similar to lifetime care. Uh, on the second one, the trials are based, uh, well, New South Wales, ACT, Geelong uh, are geographic located trials and the requirement is the person is a resident. However, um, there is, because there's always one of these, there is an exceptional circumstances provision that allows someone to be accepted when they move into the trial site and we can plan for that prior to the persons moving in. The 
requirement that we've put on that to exercise that exception is that there is a connection to the community in which they're moving. So they're not, we won't accept someone who moves in just for the purpose of getting coverage of the NDIS, but if they have family there, if they live there pre their accident, uh, then it's fine. And um, we would start, and so to some extent, I think you've been given the wrong advice or should have been advised of that extra uh, requirement. Um, but of course, we're talking the NDIS kicks in at the point of supporting the person in the community. So we don't work, uh, we don't get involved other than early planning for that living in the community in the provision of ongoing rehabilitation care outside of the Liverpool into whatever might they might need to as a transitional type of facility. That still remains the responsibility of the health system. I hope maybe that's answered your question. Hi David, my name is Deborah Byrne, I'm from the Brain Injury Association in Tasmania. Um, as you can imagine, we see IOC as critical for um, the needs of hundreds of thousands of um, people living with more mild to moderate brain injury that may not be deemed eligible for um, that tier three services, so we understand the importance of it. Um, I'm just wondering, perhaps, um, obviously without preempting for that, but whether you could perhaps share a bit more information about the agency's thinking around how ILC might work and specifically for people um, living with brain injury and with families. Uh, well, the, uh, the good news there is there's actually a discussion paper that went up on the website couple of months ago um, around the scope of what might be delivered under ILC. We put it up on our website but it's, um, and, and, and we did a lot of work around it, but uh, it's going through a process of analysing the responses to that through Commonwealth and State Officers Committees at the 